welcome to the Beltway Broadcast, the premier podcast for the workplace learning and talent development professionals of the Association for Talent Development's Metro DC chapter. We've got some great resources in store for you today. Hello, fellow ATDers. I'm Stephanie Hepka. I am the managing partner of Protoss Learning as well as a chapter past president and a member of the pod squad here at the Metro DC chapter of ATD. Hi, everyone. I'm Christina Eanes, owner of Eanes Training and also a chapter past president and fellow member of the pod squad. And of course, we always have our producer, Helena Hodges. And for today's episode, we are interviewing Stephen Rogelberg. Welcome, Stephen. Oh, thank you. It's so good to do this with you. We are really excited to have you here. I think today's conversation is either going to really enlighten or strike a nerve with people, depending on what their view of the topic is. Before we jump in, though, we would love it if you would introduce yourself to sure. all of our listeners. Sure. Uh, so my name is Steven Rogelberg, and I am an organizational psychologist. I am this crazy academic who's been studying meetings for over two decades and just very passionate around bringing science to this pain point in organizations. <laughs> and uh, my new book, the you know, Glad We Met, The Art in Science of One-on-One -on -one Meetings, to me is the most exciting thing I've ever done because it really sheds a light on an activity at work that is not realizing its full potential, but its full potential is m massive. Mm -hmm. And then on a personal front, I have a fabulous partner, two lovely kids, adult children, a pug named Mochi, <laughs> and love mountain biking, um, travel, and um, good food. Nice. I That's a fantastic introduction. And I think you are absolutely <laughs> right about the concept of the pain point when it comes to one-on-one -on -one meetings. Yeah. That's probably a great place for us to begin today. I know for many of us who are in the working world, one-on-ones happen. They are part of the day. Sometimes they are the best 30 minutes or hour you're going to spend. Yeah. Sometimes they are the worst. <laughs> Let's start there. What is it that makes a great one-on-one -on -one meeting? A one-on-one -on -one meeting, when done effectively is a meeting that's facilitated and orchestrated by a manager, but it's not for them. It's for the direct. This is this predictable opportunity that's happening at a regular cadence where the direct can share what's on their minds, mm. their concerns, their challenges. They can ask for counsel. They can ask for feedback, mm. but it's for them. And so when we think about what the best one-on-one -on -one is, is the direct report feel safe to share that they they see right up front that their agenda is going to drive everything and the manager is just facilitating a conversation they're saying they're they're constantly asking tell me more help me understand how can i help but it's not about their needs mm. yeah nice yeah no and i'm curious you, in your introduction you mentioned two decades of research and meetings yeah. Now you've got to have, there's got to be some interesting data or research that's come out of that. Is anything surprising? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do share. So, Do share. Us. So um, I'll just give you, I'll give you some tastes of the delicious science of meetings <laughs> and one-on-ones. Um, so first of all, you know, while people complain about having meetings in the one-on-one -on -one space, they want more. This really? is the one meeting that should not be an email. Yes. And typically when we survey people really around the world, typically they want these once a week. They want this predictable wow. time with their manager once a week. And we found this again across different countries. But what was very surprising was that the more senior managers actually wanted them even more. So while we think this, you know, the younger generation, this feedback crazy generation, you know, they would want these, mm -hmm. you know, at a very high rate. Well, older people actually wanted them even more. Wow. And because they recognize, they recognize the tremendous value of feeling and being seen mm -hmm. by a manager. So that I thought was a really neat finding, you know, especially yeah. again, that people come, you know, complaining about meetings is like oxygen, right? This is what everyone is doing. <laughs> yeah. And so I thought that was neat. 
Um, and I'll give you one more bonus. Sure. I'm sure we'll have more throughout our conversation. <laughs> another bonus that I thought was really neat is um, the best predictor of effectiveness of direct of uh, one-on-ones is the direct speaking more than the manager. Mm -hmm. That as soon as those ratios change, meeting effectiveness starts to increase. And now we often think, oh, yeah, it's easy. You know, OK, yeah, managers talk less. But that's hard. You know, research has shown, um, these brain studies have shown that when we talk a lot, it triggers the same parts of our brain as good food and sex. No kidding. Wow. So <laughs> we have to make sure that we give that gift to our directs. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of a nifty, nifty finding. And then obviously the other thing, okay, now I'm giving you a third bonus. <laughs> we love it. Um, you know, the other thing that is so powerful is that the outcomes associated with doing these things right, it's through the roof. Yeah. You know, they, there's a strong relationship to employee thriving, employee engagement, retention of your top talent. Mm -hmm. And then there's good data showing that it improves team effectiveness. Yeah. So if your team members are staying and performing well, your teams are excelling, this is all then elevating your performance as a manager, right? As a manager... Yeah. Our performance depends on the folks that we manage. So we off, managers often think that one-on-ones, they don't benefit, but they benefit a ton from mm. these. Yeah. You know, Stephen, I love that you mentioned, because I think what you just mentioned that, you, that came from the research just relates to life in general, oh, right? Make sure you spend quality time with people. Talk less, listen more. <laughs> You know, I think this is awesome. <laughs> no, you're, you're so right. And one of the favorite little things that emerged from this, so obviously this was a book written for organizations. Yes. Mm, yeah. But I do explore in it the fact that all these learnings can be brought back to home. Yes. Mm. <laughs> and namely, namely, we actually should be having one-on-ones with our children. Oh, absolutely. Now, I'm not saying that there have to be you know, these um, hard calendar holds that we would have in a workplace. <laughs> um, but the fact is, identifying intentional time with your children to understand what's on their minds, mm. understand their agenda, their concerns, this is where parental relationships can really, really improve. Mm. Otherwise, everything is just can be very transactional or yeah. punitive, right? Correctional. Yeah. But these one-on-ones just allow a depth. And so it makes great sense at work, but the learnings all apply to the home. And I love that. I love that. Yeah. It's nice to see when there is that crossover too, you know, when there are things that you are doing at work or at home that can benefit you yeah. in that other space. You had mentioned too, you're talking a little bit about the outcomes of doing these one-on-ones right. Mm -hmm. What does it look like to do a one-on-one -on -one right? Is that about preparation? Is that about agenda setting? Maybe it's about flexibility. I'm curious what the science yeah. says or, you know, what your experience has been there. Sure. So as you know, the, the book is titled, Glad We Met, The Art and Science. Yes. <laughs> because this is an interesting topic. You know, the science definitely provides a whole host of clues on how to do these things. But ultimately, how I wrote it was not a prescription. It's not mm. do X, Y, and then Z, because that doesn't seem to be the magic form. There isn't a magic formula. What makes sense is for you to think about who you are, your values, think about the preferences and values of your people, and then to make choices, pick the practices that will work in that situation. Mm. So basically, you know, how I've kind of created the book is that you got this preparatory phase and preparation is really important. You know, ultimately, if you're doing these one-on-ones on a regular cadence, you have this notes that are accumulating over time. And this becomes the story of this employee and their challenges. And that's great corpus of material for you to design and think about your next one-on-one -on -one, as well as future performance appraisals. By the way, a neat bonus is if you do take these constant notes, you can throw it into AI and AI will identify the themes, they'll identify changes over time. It's awesome. 
All right. Anyways. Wow. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that as an opportunity. That's incredible. It's awesome. So this preparation is you're, you're making, you know, you're connecting to the past stories. Um, you are, you know, preparing, you're creating a lightweight agenda, but the direct is driving the creation of the agenda. Yep. Yep. Um, so you're cueing them to maybe come to the meeting with the list of items that they want to talk about, but you're priming them to think big picture, sh- small picture, short term, long term. And you're reminding them that they can talk about anything they want. Um, so there's the, this phase is also about the creation of a lightweight plan. And that matters. Yeah. Um, then it's also just preparing your mindset. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one of the really neat findings is something called the Pygmalion effect is that our expectations of an individual drives our behaviors. Mm-hmm. And they found this initially in schools that when teachers thought that their, that kids were lazy, they actually behaved in a way that reified their laziness, yeah. right? They became in their face, micromanaging, reminding. And as a result, the kids started to act consistent with the teacher's expectations. The same thing applies to one-on-ones. So you need to go in there with this expectation that your employee wants to grow and develop. And when you have that, now you listen better, right? You ask better questions and you're more willing to offer um, support and counsel. Then during the meeting itself, it's all about this facilitation. It's, you know, constantly hearing, learning, asking the employee for their opinion on how to solve their problems. This is that also takes great discipline. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the key things that managers have to realize is that when they ask an employee their opinion on how to solve, typically what happens is they say, oh, here's another way of doing it, their yeah. way of doing it. Yeah. That demotivates their employee. Yes, it does. So pick your battles. If there's not a big, meaningful gap between their idea and yours, go with their idea. Yeah. It's all right. If it doesn't work out, you can have a conversation <laughs> around it. Learning. Yes. Learning. That's the goal. So you've got this great conversation taking place. And then the close is really essential. You know, the close is where, you know, folks come together and they say, okay, this is what I agreed to do. This is what you agreed to do. There's a handshake. The manager um, needs to, um, you know, take notes. And then they also want to try to end on a more positive note. Mm -hmm. And let me say a little bit more about that as a fun little science um, piece. One of my favorite research studies was done by this guy, Daniel Kahneman, who won a Nobel mm-hmm. Prize. And what he did was he assigned subjects, participants, to one of two conditions. Condition one is they put their hand in basically ice cold water for a minute. That hurts, right? That's painful. Yes. In condition two, they did the exact same thing. 60 seconds in this painful water. But then they said, now you're going to do it again for 30 more seconds in slight, slightly less cold water, still painful, but slightly less cold. And what they found is that those people in the second condition, despite having their hand in cold, miserable water for longer, actually were more willing to participate in the study again, if asked, because it ended more positively. Mm. Wow. I love that. Yeah. So ending (laughs) on kind of this positive note is also really important. Yeah. And before I start to breathe, (laughs) um, (laughs) I do want to tell you one thing that goes back to something Christina asked earlier, because I I want to say, because I just, I'm I'm remembering that this is all about ATD and I love your organization. And I want to tell you something pretty horrifying. Okay. Uh You ready? We can take it. All right. (laughs) I have only found one organization that actually provides training to yeah. leaders on how to do one-on-ones. No kidding. Yeah, that's not surprising. One. Yeah. Training professionals are missing this yeah. opportunity. They say to do it. They just don't say how. Right. <laughs> and that's where Go I really it. hope this book, like I'm hoping this book grabs training professionals. Yeah. This is an amazing opportunity for training professionals. There, This is an empty space. It's a critical strategic activity with amazing outcomes Mm -hmm. and there's nothing there. So training professionals could very much rise up and claim a very special space. I love it. 
it's really empowering to hear that too, because I would imagine that one of the reasons that there's a lack of opportunity when it comes to training in this area is because people think this stuff is easy when it is not easy. Oh, so <laughs> well said. Yeah. You are completely correct. People just think when it comes to interpersonal relationships that we're talented. Right. But yeah. clearly our divorce rates <laughs> suggest something different. Exactly. Exactly. You think, how hard is it to sit down with someone and talk to them for 20 or 30 minutes? Yeah. It's outright impossible in some cases if yeah. you don't go into it knowing what those outcomes could be and you're not there right. to support the person in front of you. No, it's... Well, and the other thing that um, I'm sure, and you know this question is coming, um, I, we've all heard this when we talk to t people about you need to do one-on-ones with your folks. Mm. I don't have time. I don't have time to do all that prep. Yeah. And I don't yeah. have time on my schedule to meet with them. So what would your response be okay, to that? Okay, great. Mm -hmm. I, I'm so glad you asked that. That's so important. Um, first of all, I mean, I mean, there's layers to answering Absolutely. that question. So yeah, first yeah. of all, it saves time. Yeah, It's yeah. actually an activity that buys you time. Yeah. Um, directly in the form of what generally seems to happen is that when you have this regular cadence, um, people don't interrupt you as much because yeah. they know they have you. So they save those interruptions. That makes sense. And so that's a time savings. Another time savings is the fact that these meetings is where you align your people. You help them with their obstacles. Yeah. Thus, there's less rework. There's more coordination. There's more connection between the team members. So they actually perform more optimally. Yes. And this also saves you time. And so these activities, um, absolutely, they are an investment. But unlike so many other things that we do, like this, absolutely, there's a strong, strong um, return on that investment. I mean, even take the situation, um, you know, well, we all know the, the old adage that people don't leave bad jobs, they leave bad bosses. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So one-on-ones are your opportunity to prove you're not a bad boss. Yeah. Think about how much time it takes you to replace good talent. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. Time and money. <laughs> Time and money. So these activities are your defense yeah. against losing your top talent. And that ultimately also returns time. Oh, I love that response. Mine is usually, you don't have time not to. <laughs> well, it, now I got a lot more ammo there. <laughs> it's true. And, and what I'm really hearing too is that it's not just the impact on the relationship and on the work that might get done. This is an organizational impact. Yeah. I mean, there, it's much bigger than just the one-on-one -on -one meeting. You may see better results across an organization. Is that true? 100%. <laughs> 100%. You know, especially in more distributed workplaces, mm. um, you know, this is just a way of still kind of building that connective tissue amongst individuals, individuals and their leader and with the team. That makes a yeah. lot of sense to me. Yeah. No. Oh, go ahead. No, no, no please. Okay. Yeah. Anything else you want to add on, uh, on meetings? You want our viewers and oh, listeners to know? Of course, so they need to read the book. <laughs> They need yes. to read the book. I can't yes, wait. Yeah. And anything well, for um, today. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, a nice kind of wrap, wrap up. Um, well, I'll, I'll share two things. So one of the things I do in the book is I do provide some content for directs. Mm -hmm. It does take two to tango. The direct does have some responsibilities in this. Yes. Obviously the leader has more, mm -hmm. but the direct does too. So I, I do spend time talking about how the direct can increase the chances of these things working. So, and I'll give you a little example. Um, a direct report can't get their needs met from one-on-ones unless they truly know what their needs are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a very simple statement, but it's, it's also profound. Yeah. People complain about not getting their needs met, but it's often a function of them not knowing their needs and articulating their needs. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a whole host of direct behaviors. I think that's, um, so I want to share that. Um, you know, I guess the other thing I'll just share as a closing thought is this notion that these one-on-ones are the stage for leadership. Mm -hmm. This is where your people will know who you really are. Yeah. Right. That, conversation with with those people and your interest in them is an expression of your values 
right? It's easy to say, yeah, I want my employees to thrive and grow. That's easy. Yeah. yeah. This is where you behave in a manner that demonstrate those values. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll also say that if you look at organizational value statements, and I actually do this in the book, you actually can call out in organizational value statements, the commercial for why one-on-ones need to take place. It's all over organizational value statements. And so one-on-ones are just this amazing opportunity for leaders. They're amazing opportunity for training professionals. Yes. And they're just, it's a great opportunity, even more broadly for humanity as the greatest predictor of life satisfaction is helping others. Mm. And one-on-ones are that perfect opportunity to help others. Oh my gosh. Powerful. That's an, it's an incredible thought to share. And I will say too, as we've been talking, I was thinking about some of the one-on-ones that I've had before. One of my favorite managers, whenever we'd start a one-on-one, asked the same question every single time. And it was, what would you like to talk about today? And what I loved about that is that put the ball in my court. I could bring problems. I could bring celebrations. I could bring anything I wanted to the table. But it was space where I was seen and listened to. And I think that now I realize all these years later why that worked. It really does, you know, put the employee, the direct report right right in the spotlight and give them that space that they're looking for. I I love this. This has been incredible. We all want to be seen. Yeah. Yeah, we do. Right? That question that your manager asked made you feel seen. Yes. Mm. Absolutely right. Yeah. Well, before we get to those rapid fire questions that we ask (laughs) at the end of every episode, (laughs) can you share a little bit about how listeners or viewers can learn more about you, your book? Oh, sure. Yes. Thank you. So definitely my website. I have a strong LinkedIn presence too. So people could easily find me there, Stephen Rogelberg on LinkedIn. Um, but my website, stevenrogelberg.com, stevenrogelberg.com. That's the key resource. I have so much on there for people to download. Um, I really tried to make it into a repository of great information. Mm, nice. There's clearly, obviously, there's links to buy the book. And I hope people will buy this new book. I'm mm-hmm. so committed to getting these ideas out there that I've committed to donating all my author royalties mm-hmm. to the American Cancer Society. Mm-hmm. So... You know, I buy the book if you want to learn about one-on-ones or buy the book if you want to help eradicate cancer. Oh, Oh, I love it. That's incredible. (laughs) Or both. Incredible. (laughs) Or both. (laughs) (laughs) Oh. Well, at the end of every episode, we ask three rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. (laughs) The first one, obviously, other than your books, give us one book everyone must read and why. Uh, so I have a crazy throwback book. It was a Dale Carnegie book, mm-hmm. um, How to Start Living and Stop Worrying or How to Stop Worrying and Start Living, one of those things. Uh-huh. Um, but it's like 100 years old. Um, it's filled, you know, unfortunately, it has examples and language that make us cringe. Yeah. But the core <laughs> of the, the content, I just thought was phenomenal. Mm. It was just a great way of thinking about our worries and our troubles mm. and reframing them. So I, that was a, just a very meaningful book for me. Mm. Nice. Okay. What is one tool, identify that however you want, that you can't live without? Um, well, I'll use a... Um, email tool because I'm getting (laughs) right now with the book dropping, I'm just getting overwhelmed. And I love using this tool um, by Boomerang, which basically allows me to quickly triage all my emails. Mm. And if I have something that I don't need to act on right away, I can send it away and it comes back in (laughs) one, two or four weeks, whatever it is. Wow. That's great. So that really definitely helps me manage a crazy workload. Nice. Ooh, I might have to check that out. Yeah, same here. Yeah. Okay, what is the best piece of advice you have ever been given? Um, so I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> and I thought about it, and I just couldn't come up with any one piece. You know, I am a big believer that in every conversation, in every relationship, you're getting tremendous life lessons. Yeah. You're getting life lessons in what people do and say, but also what they don't do and don't yeah. say. Yeah. And so I, I think the best piece of advice is to truly listen to people. 
truly observe the world and be mindful. And through those activities, you just keep growing. Yeah. And the corollary to that, as you grow, just keep helping. Um, do as much as you can to elevate the human condition. And so those are, that's a constant, you know, that's a constellation of advice I've accumulated. Yeah. Um, and it certainly resonates with me. You know, what I love about that advice is not only is it great for us as people in general, it also ties so nicely into what you should be taking into some of these one-on-one -on -one meetings that you mm -hmm. may have. Listening and helping is really what makes yeah. the world of work work. Yeah. And it's, you know, really nice to think about keeping those first and foremost yeah. in your mind as you sit down. It can really change how some yeah. of those conversations and relationships build. Love it. Yeah. What a wonderful conversation. Stephen, thank you so much for being here, for joining us, and especially for sharing some really incredible thought around what I think a lot of us probably figure is just yet another meeting on the calendar. I think you've changed a lot of minds today, certainly Good. mine. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. I, I really appreciate it. And thank you for what you both do. Oh, well, we so appreciate it. And of course, many thanks to all of you in our community for listening and watching. And before you go, we do have a message from our producer, Helena Hodges. Are you interested in learning more about the Metro DC chapter of ATD or following us on social media? Go to dcatd.org and click on About. Would you like to be even more involved in our wonderful community? Go to DCATD.org and click on Volunteer to get started. Mm -hmm.